Okay, I'm now be going to look at um, capitalism and the domestic economy. People remarked that I was using Scottish flags in my last video. I'm using flags to indicate the source of the data or the area that I'm taking the information from. So in this section, I'm going to be dealing with Canadian data, and that's because Canada actually employs good data on how people spend their time outside of the paid economy. This is an idea that was originally promoted by the Soviet economist Stromlin, but it's actually taken out up by the Canadians, and they have time budgets for how families spend their time. And we can see that there's a consistent pattern that women are spending more hours doing unpaid housework a day than men are. Just over four hours, men doing, men's unpaid housework ra rose a bit, um, so did women's, but it's still a st significant gap. Um, so this is a retained feature of the domestic economy that's still operating in Canada, which is a very modern economy. And if we then look at the pay rates, um, we see that the hourly rate of pay of women was $19, or just almost $20, men's was $23. A relatively small percentage difference, um, but when you take into account that on average women worked 2.8 days, 2.8 hours a day in the paid economy and men 4.2 hours a day, the difference in their mean daily earnings was very considerable. Men earned almost twice as much as women did. And if you look at this part of the diagram, you see there is a mirror image. The number of unpaid hours versus paid hours is a mirror image for men and women. And this affects the total amount of money that women get. And when we say that the average paid hours is 2.8, it doesn't mean that the average woman goes in, works 2.8 hours and comes home. It means if you average over the women who have full-time jobs and the women who don't have full-time jobs, it comes to 2.8 hours. If you add together the paid and unpaid hours of work, which is almost the same for both sexes, men get $14 or got $14 an hour, women got just under $8 an hour. So almost a two to one difference. And the biggest cause of this is the extra unpaid labour that the women do. This is an abiding feature of the domestic economy, even in Canada, which, as I say, is a modern, up-to-date capitalist country. Now, if we take the same year, we can work out the rate of surplus value in Canada. There was a total of 766 billion in wages, 497 billion in profits, interest and rent. So the rate of surplus value was 65%. If we take the average wage across both sexes per hour, it was 23, just over $23. If you multiply that by 1.65, you find that an hour's labor created in Canada in 2011, $38.72. From that, you can work out the relative exploitation rate. You subtract the actual wage paid from the, the, the $38 value created, and we work out the exploitation rate. So that, unsurprisingly, it shows that even in the capitalist sector of the economy, women are exploited more than men. So they do more unpaid labor at home and in the capitalist sector, they're exploited more. Now, in how the world works, 
I go into the attempts by orthodox Canadian economists to explain this and show that they have no real explanation for the gender pay gap in Canada. And that's because they think wages are the value of labour. And there's no real clear reason to them why women's labour should be less valuable than men's. Marxism, on the other hand, can explain it, since it says wages are not the value of labour. They're the price of reproduction of labour power, which is something quite different. The point is that the total family wage has, be, has to be enough to support the existing workers and raise the next generation. And the family ma wage is made up of the father and mother's wages put together. And together, these must be enough for a family to survive at the costs of living which exist in Canada. If it were the case, which has never really been the case, but had it been the case that most families only had one male earner, that would set a floor on men's wages. Men's wages, the floor of men's wages couldn't fall below that necessary to sustain the family. If, on the other hand, all families had both mother and father working for the same number of hours, the sum of their wages would have to be enough to support a family. And under those circumstances, we would expect the gender pay gap to vanish. That's a prediction of Marxist economics. But it's also a prediction that the rate of exploitation would rise because the capitalists would now be getting twice as many hours labour a day and paying out the same amount in necessary labour time. And in fact, this is what data shows. What we see is that the percentage of women doing paid labour between the 1970s and the 2000s over a 30 year period showed a gradual increase from uh, low 40% to around 60%. At the same time, there was a slight decline in the percentage of men participating in the labour force. Now, the prediction of the Marxian theory of value is that this would result in a narrowing of the gender pay gap. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. The gender pay gap declines over the same period. And if you correlate the ratios of male and female participation in the workforce to the gender pay gap, you get an over 90% correlation. That is to say, statistically, 90% of the change can be explained in terms of the change in the participation rate. But of course, since no, the important thing here is, a second important thing to note is, women's wages rose, men's wages remained stagnant. But since productivity was rising, this meant the overall rate of exploitation was rising. And this is an obvious failure of liberal capitalism to the extent that it's able to narrow the pay gap. It only does it at the cost of a higher rate of exploitation overall, which is most clearly expressed by the fact that rents are running out of control in Canada is becoming more and more difficult for people to afford a house. You certainly can't afford a family house on one income. Um, you can see the, the rise in the, the rentals here, and that is a few years out of date. I've been checking on the latest figures, and a three-bedroom flat in Canada now costs over $2,400 a month. So, what would be the socialist response to this? One is that childcare becomes the responsibility of society. The Soviet Union, for example, provided free nursery education and after school care. Free meals at, at schools. You could also provide free school clothing. There were no fees for higher education. 
and there were full maintenance bursaries for students. The effect of this is both to help reduce the gender gap, but it also, as importantly, eliminates class differences in education. Because the ability to afford higher education depends heavily on social class. If higher education is free and there are maintenance grants, that widens it. Second point is payment according to labour, not at the value of labour power. And you abolish the distinction between men's work and women's work. All of us are mortal. The time of every person is precious. It's equally precious whatever our sex. In the proposals we put forward in Towards a New Socialism, men and women, whatever their trade or profession, get paid one hour's labour credit for one hour's work. Alongside this, you get the socialisation of tasks which were performed in the domestic economy before. Re you reduce the burden of family cooking by having the provision of community and workplace restaurants. You have meals sold at cost price. You provide food, food that's nutritious and healthy, not the fast junk food that you get in the capitalist economy. Such places all potentially provide social contact for all ages and reduce the isolation and loneliness of contemporary life. 